Washington calling counter spy. <laughs> Washington calling counter spy. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. Harding, counter spy, calling Washington. The Blue Network presents Philip H. Lord. Counter Spy. Germany has its Gestapo, Italy at Dover, and Japan its Black Dragon. But matched against all of these secret enemy agents, are Uncle Sam's highly trained counter spies. Visualize eighth counter spy of them all as David Harding. In Washington, Brigadier General Whitcomb sat in his private office at a large oak desk. Standing in front of him was First Lieutenant John O'Brien. Lieutenant O'Brien. Yes, sir? I have another mission for you. A most important mission. Yes, General? Let's see. Uh, you've been my official messenger for seven years, correct? Nine years, sir. Nine years? Hmm. Well, Lieutenant, you've been most methodical, resourceful, and diligent. Thank you, sir. Now, this envelope contains certain very important documents. They concern changing some of our heavy artillery on the West Coast. Uh, carry it inside your uniform. Now, I want you to deliver these to the commander of the San Francisco fortifications. Deliver them right into his own hands and to no other living person. Yes, sir. Shall I fly, sir? Uh, no, I don't want to call attention to your mission in any way. Just quietly get on the train. As though you were carrying nothing of any importance. There's a transcontinental train tonight at 10 o'clock, Lieutenant. Yes, sir, there is. All I've got to do is go back to my hotel room and cancel several engagements I had, sir. Hello? Hello? Oh. This is Lieutenant O'Brien calling. <laughs> no. No, I can't take you to the theater tonight. No, I'm not fooling. Oh, a new dress? Honestly, I'm awfully sorry, but I've just received instructions to leave for San Francisco. Yes, San Francisco. Well, I'll be back in about a week, and then I'll see you every night. Oh, my God. 
just a minute. Conductor, uh, something uh, terrible has uh, happened. What happened, madam? Uh, we hear the fight. A glass of broken. Where? About three or four feet in front of me. Uh, uh, turn your flashlight up there. We can't get the lights on. Somebody's cut the wires. Uh, right there. See? Why, the glass is broken out. And blood. Oh, that's where the army officer was sitting. He must have been thrown out the window. Hold on, everybody. I'm going to pull the emergency. Calling in. G8, calling in. Mr. Harding. Mrs. Harding, go ahead. We located place by tracks where Lieutenant O'Brien's body landed. There was a great deal of blood. We traced footprints from there a hundred yards to the main road. Somebody had a car parked there. There were some tread marks of car in dirt beside road. Are you making plaster casts of footprints in the car tread? Yes, sir. They'll be ready by morning, sir. Good. Stand by for further instructions. Throwing O'Brien off that train was certainly a carefully planned job, Mr. Harding. Yes, David, it was no ordinary job. The only ones who knew about those plans being sent were the higher-ups. I made every move Lieutenant O'Brien made check carefully. This job has all the earmarks of a high-class, sophisticated plot. Davis, I want somebody to do some special work for me who travels in high Washington circles. Couldn't we get one of our own operators into that circle? We could. But I want somebody already there, some prominent person who wouldn't be suspected of working with us. I'm going to talk to Lady Ashton. She's helped you before. She's a social leader. And she can be trusted. I need a woman who's fairly young, beautiful, sophisticated, worldly, who travels in Washington's higher social set. I see. Have you anyone safely in mind, Mr. Hardy? Yes. Norma Braley. She's a French refugee. She's invited everywhere. She's continental. And very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> You're... You're sure this is all business, Mr. Harding? Yeah, she is attractive. Mm. <laughs> but if Miss Braley would be willing to work with me and follow my instructions, she could be of great help. And you wish me to give a dinner so that you may meet her? Well, in Washington here, Lady Ashton, I'm often watched very carefully. I'd like to have a meeting appear to be a chance one. How about dinner Friday? I'll see that you meet Miss Braley socially then. That would be fine, Lady Ashton. I'll be there. Yes, but you must have some opinions on how the war is going, Mr. Harding. I know how it's going to go, Miss Braley. Uh, we'll walk over to the other side of the room for a minute. Yes, certainly. You know, I think Lady Ashton gives the most entertaining evenings of any hostess in Washington. Oh, she's a very charming person. Uh, Miss Bailey. Yes? I don't want to be seen talking to you too long, so I'll come right to the point. Oh, you sound very serious, Mr. Harding. You're a French refugee, Miss Bailey. You fr uh, fled Paris just before it fell. Your entire family is still there. Well, how did you know that? Uh, more people are investigated nowadays than they think. Uh, Miss Braley. Yes? Would you take some risks if you thought you really could be of help against our mutual enemies? Oh, I'd do anything in the world. Everything is a risk nowadays. I need someone who travels in Washington's best society. I need someone who's never been connected with counter-spying in any way. Someone of courage, insight, sophistication. You mean me? Yes. On a very hard and difficult case right now. 
I need someone just like you. In fact, you. But I... I don't think I'm qualified for such an important undertaking, Mr. Harding. I... I've never had any training. You won't need any, Miss Bailey. You'll do exactly as I tell you. And you really think I can help? Very definitely. Then I'll do anything you ask. It's the least I can do. You will be in danger. The ring I refer to has just murdered one army officer. I'm not easily frightened, Mr. Harding. I went through a good deal before I escaped to the United States. Then it's agreed. Now, I believe something very important is going to break later tonight. Now, any calls I make to you must be made in such a way that they can't be traced. Now, tomorrow morning at 10.30, go to the Farnsworth Drugstore on Maple Street. Yes. There are three telephone booths there. Go into the middle booth. Make several telephone calls so you can hold the booth so no one else will be using the phone. Now, hang up the receiver at exactly 11.30. Now, I have that phone number. I'll do the same thing on the other end of town so that my call to you will be from one telephone booth to another so the call can't be traced. I'll be there, Mr. Harding, right to the second. And be sure and don't call me by name over the phone. Hello? Who are you? I'm in a telephone booth by appointment for a call at exactly 11.30. Good. Now listen carefully. A Sir Harold Palmer arrived late last night in Washington from Ontario, Canada. We've been watching him up there for over three months. He's not really of the nobility. We believe his credentials are false, but we've not been able to make sure. Yes. Now, this is the first time that Sir Harold has left Canada. And it's so close to that event which happened on the train four nights ago, we believe there may be some connection. Now, I've arranged for Lady Ashton to give a ball on this coming Wednesday evening. Somehow it will be arranged so Sir Harold will be there. I want you to meet Sir Harold Palmer at that ball. Lady Ashton will introduce you to him. Buttering. Get to know him. I'll do my best. You have a small automatic? One you can carry in your purse? Yes. Keep it with you at all times. That's all for now. We're so delighted to see you this evening. It's very kind of you to invite me, Lady Ashton. I, I, I just come down from Canada. I'm really quite a stranger in Washington. Mr. Harold, I want you to meet a guest of mine, Miss Bailey. Oh, how do you do, Miss Bailey? Good evening, Sir Harold. I, I've been admiring Miss Bailey all evening, hoping I might have the opportunity of meeting her. <laughs> there, Norma. Men gave up saying things like that to me years ago. Oh, no, they didn't, Lady Ashton. Mm. Will you... Will you dance this one with me, Miss Bailey? I'd like to, Sir Harold. I've been admiring your dancing. Operator 7 is made on his floor at hotel. That is all. G8 reporting. Gentleman in question and lady went for a drive out of Washington. Stopped at Mayflower Club on Highway 3 for dinner and dancing. Has just returned to Washington. If gentleman orders theater tickets for play opening Friday, she gets two in seats in fourth row, center aisle. That is all. G8 reporting. Gentleman in question and lady went for a drive out of Washington. Stopped at Mayflower Club on Highway 3 for dinner and dancing. Has just returned to Washington. 
reporting. Operator 6 followed couple in question this morning. She went shopping, and he accompanied her. Overheard conversation indicating they are planning to meet this evening in his hotel room. Check. In O'Sahara, it, it is rather unusual in this country for a young woman to go up to the hotel room with a man. And they're so engaged, or something. Is that so? Very interesting. Well, uh, continuing, we had our in our home for many years what I could call as fine a collection of pastoral art as there is outside of a museum. We very seldom went out of an evening. You know, the paintings were so beautiful, landscaping of all kinds. Mm. I... Yes, I see. Am I boring you with this long dissertation on art, Miss? It was just a question. Did you yawn? Oh, no. Oh, no, most certainly not. Uh, continue. Tell me more about these uh, oil paintings in Dorchester. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Harding, but I didn't know what to do. I know, but it's 2 o'clock in the morning, Norma. Come up to my hotel room. It's for those who might be watching me wise to the fact that you're working with me. But something terribly important has happened, Mr. Harding. What? Well, Sir Harold kept talking and talking about art so late that I asked him to order some food. And when he went into the adjoining room to telephone room service, I had a chance to look in several drawers, and I found these papers. Let me see them. I had this little gun with me in my bag, but... Well, no woman would ever have to show it to Sir Harold. Here. Huh. You looked at these? Yes, they're reports. And they state very clearly they concern confidential information between the United States and Canada. Yes. And this one even goes so far as to mention certain fortifications. Well, then it's, it's the information you want? Not the exact information. But it very definitely shows Sir Harold is working against the interests of the United States and Canada. But you should not have come here, Norma. In fact, you shouldn't have taken these papers. Yes, but why? Now you've got proof against Sir Harold. Yes, but he'll miss these papers and he'll know you've tricked him and disappear. Oh, then I haven't helped. Oh, yes, yes, you've helped. Uh, Do you suppose that someone who saw me come up here to your room? Have I caused you more trouble? Unless I miss my guess, this is a report that Sir Harold has already left. Hello? G-8 reporting. Sir Harold has checked out of hotel. Has ordered car from nearest garage. Shall I replace chauffeur? No. Too dangerous at this point. Drop his trail. Tell operator 37 to pick it up. Yes, sir. I never felt so badly in my life, Mr. Harding. I feel that I've, I, I've bungled the whole thing. Now, don't feel that way, Norma. You just accomplished so much more than I expected, I wasn't ready for it. You're not just saying that. No. I mean it. Oh. I'd rather hear you say something like that than, than anyone else. Now, of course, the artillery plans which were stolen from Lieutenant O'Brien have already been changed. A new set of plans is being sent to California Saturday night by plane. We'll wait and see if the Gestapo makes an attempt to get those new plans Saturday night. I see. But what can I do, Mr. Harding? Now, tomorrow night, dress very simply. Yes. Take the bus, the Maryland bus, to the end of the line. Get off there and wait for me. Things have taken a pretty serious turn. Tomorrow night should tell us a lot. Can you tell me now where we're going? To a little farmhouse about ten miles further down the road. Well, why are we going there? Well, we have a shortwave listening set there. There's nothing near the farmhouse. The reception is excellent. And you still think I can be of help? Very definitely. Yes. But I can't tell how until we hear this shortwave broadcast tonight. 
See, every Tuesday and Saturday night, from 1.15 to 1.30 in the morning, there's a shortwave broadcast by a bootleg station to Germany. We've been listening in on it for several weeks. But who's doing the broadcasting? Gestapo agents. In fact, we'll both listen in tonight. Never seen so much electrical equipment, Mr. Harden. Now, you sit down here beside me, Norma. Now, take these earphones. Yeah. I'm calling another shortwave station of our own. One of my men's operating it. 42B. 42B. Come in on 24.5 megacycles. Come in. Your signal is weak, but I can get it. Come in. Proceed according to schedule. That will be three minutes and 20 seconds. Then meet me at appointment. You get it? Exactly three minutes, 10 seconds, and we'll contact. That is all. Was that a short wave station in another farmhouse? No. Oh, it was a portable sending and receiving set in a car. That's why I didn't have too much power. Oh. Now, you don't understand German, do you, Norma? No, I don't. Well, then I'll interpret for you. Broadcast we should be picking up right now. Now, take these earphones. He's making contact. You'll hear him in a minute. And this radio station we're hearing is operating illegally in direct contact with Berlin? Yes. But we've got it spotted. 24,500 nach Berlin. Achtung! Geheimbericht von größter Wichtigkeit. He's just saying he's got some real news tonight. Auf Welle 24,500 nach Berlin. Die Pläne zur Befestigungsanlagen der nordamerikanischen Westküstenverteidigung sind fangemäß gestohlen worden. Talking about the West Coast fortification papers that were stolen from us. Leichtigkeit überwunden. Die beiliegenden Dokumente He's telling Berlin that the Gestapo have the papers, but the question is how to get them out of the country. Now he's saying revised plans are to be sent to the West Coast this Saturday night. Who are you? Get out of here. You make a move, I'll shoot. The United States counter spy. Now give your hands up. Move away from that broadcasting microphone. Oh, they're being captured. But this is just an amateur sending set. Oh, yeah? Put the cuffs on him, Frank. We've already got the cuffs on your three pals. The two downstairs and one in the other room. Take them out, boys. Remember, these four are the ones who murdered Lieutenant O'Brien. This shortwave set won't be used anymore tonight. Or any other night. Well, Norma, you really heard something that time. They were really captured by your men. They certainly were. Right now, they're being taken away so fast, they don't know what's happening. Yes, but how did it happen just right then? That was the message I sent out the first thing I came into this room. We had everything set. Come on. I want to drive back and face them. Where are we going now, Dave? We've got a place where we hide people like them away for a while. A prison? Well, sort of a private prison. With their steel bars and escape-proof devices. That's what you mean. After that, it's the firing squad. All these people in these cells, Norma, are agents of the Gestapo or the Japanese Black Dragon. Let's go into this cell now. Wait. Oh. Oh, it's horrible. These prisoners just look at us. You can see in their eyes. They they know they're going to be shot. Oh, God. Yes, sir? Check and see if a Sir Harold Palmer has been brought in yet. If he has, bring him to this cell. Right, sir. Yeah. Sit down in this cart, Norma. We may have quite a little weight. Dave... How did you catch 
Mr. Harris. <laughs> we'll let him do the dogging when he gets here. Hello, Emma. Let me tell you something. Because something very startling is about to happen. Lieutenant John O'Brien was a confidential messenger for the Army. On his last mission, he was murdered in a train while the lights were out. The window was broken and his body thrown out. Mr. Harold, be in just a minute, Mr. Harding. Oh, good. Well, Norma, we checked O'Brien's movement. Everything he did after he received those confidential instructions. O'Brien went back to his hotel room, and the only thing he did besides packing was to put in five telephone calls. Three were calls to the Army Department, one was a call to his mother, and one was a call to a girl. We traced that call. It showed in the hotel records. We immediately started investigating that girl, and it gradually showed up that her background wasn't quite what she claimed it to be. In other words, she found out that Lieutenant O'Brien was a trusted government messenger. She'd become acquainted with him and started seeing a good deal of him. And when he telephoned her on this certain night and said he was going to San Francisco, she knew it must be on important business. And as he was a confidential government messenger, she knew he'd probably have the papers with him. So she passed the word on, gave orders for the two men to board the train and after a little while cut the electric light wires in that car, murder O'Brien, throw his body off at a certain prearranged time. Two other men in an automobile were waiting and carried his body away because they were afraid he might have important papers on his person. Well, were those men who were running the short wave station the ones who murdered Lieutenant O'Brien? Yes. But they received their instructions from the woman to do it. The woman was the real murderer. Did you send for me, sir? Yes. I believe you know, Miss Braley. Oh. Yes, I, I've had that privilege. Sir Harold Palmer. That's right. Sir Harold to you, Miss Braley. But a counter spy to me. George Davis. He's a counter spy? Well, he's the Canadian you sent me to work. He's the one I stole the papers from. And a very good job of stealing them you did, too. Miss Braley, you are under arrest by the United States government. Oh, no. No. No, I'll kill you. I'll kill myself. Take it away from her, Davis. Get it. Get it. While you were stealing the papers, Davis here was putting blank cartridges in the gun you had in your handbag. Killing comes pretty easy to you, doesn't it? You rat, you swine. I wasn't absolutely positive that you were the woman, Miss Braley. So we heard that broadcast tonight, and your spies passed on word about the revised fortification papers being sent to the coast Saturday night. Then I knew that you were the one we wanted. Because that was just a made-up story. And you and I were the only two in the whole world who knew it. What are you going to do with me? You're very unobserving. You should have noticed that this is the woman's section. And half an hour before we arrived, this very cell was reserved for you. This is the place that you're going to stay. Come on, David. You can't do this to me. You can't do it. I'm a French refugee. Do you understand? I'm a French refugee. You're a French refugee right from Berlin. You never saw France in your life. We checked your family. They live on Connecton South of Hamburg. You can't do that, you smile. American is a spy He's about the most vicious spy we've taken in since the war started, Harding. I have a feeling she's responsible for a lot of important information leaking out, Davis. But one thing's certain, she won't get out. And that great invisible army of undercover agents, which is working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to protect this country from enemies within. Yeah.